This is the Restraint and Handling of Animals, Chapter 6. We're going to talk about canine, feline, equine uh, capture and restraint in this. We're going to talk about how to diminish stress and how what equipment we might use, uh, different methods, and some advantages and disadvantages of chemical restraint. Um, also different positionings uh, for uh, cats and dogs, and then talking about horses as well. So why do we restrain? And, and I have to tell you that restraint is one of the most important techniques that you can learn to do, one of the most important skills that you have as a technician, period. I don't care this summer, but if you cannot restrain an animal, you're not going to do well. Um, you have to be able to restrain an animal for your safety as well as their safety. So you want to control the animal so it can receive medical care. You want to do it properly. You want to protect the animal from injury during treatment procedures. You want to protect other personnel, including yourself. And you want to protect your practice owners from liability. It is one of the most important things that we can teach you. Um, we do train you to do this restraint. Uh, we have you practice it, practice it, practice it. You should be doing the restraint in just about every situation unless you are performing another skill. Um, you need to practice, practice, practice. Um, one thing that uh, I want to say is that owners, unless they're veterinary technicians and have been trained, should not be restraining their own animals. So first, it starts with the approach. You want to observe the animal before approaching. You need to in interpret their behavior. And having taken this class um, and uh, taking, uh, gone through the lecture in, in uh, chapter four, five and read everything you can and looked at all the videos, you know how to interpret behavior. You can see fear, aggression, postural changes and warnings and mixed signals. You need to understand that um, Animals aren't always sure what they want to do either, and you can change their behavior by changing your behavior. You want to know uh, how to approach them. Different species have different ways that they prefer to be approached. With a dog, if you approach from the rear, that's normal. With a cat, you want to approach from the front. That's normal. For capture, dogs uh, have a fight or flight response, um, so we want to minimize anxiety. After capture, we want to minimize noise and activity. We want to be as efficient in handling dogs as, as uh, possible, use lift tables for large dogs, and if we have an escape dog, we want to calm everything down and soothe that dog. For cats, we have to close their escape routes. They can get through... Um, and up and around things very easily. Uh, we want to make sure we have restraint devices nearby. Um, some pretty common restraint device devices would be a uh, capture net, and the net can be either a square item that we use in a squeeze uh, mat, uh, uh, manner, or it could be a fish net uh, that we use in order to capture them. Um, we want to be able to safely remove a pet from a hospital cage and you'll you'll meet those people who are just fantastic with cats they can approach cats in the cage cages are where cats are most vulnerable and they feel it and so often removing them from the cage is it's important to go in calmly swiftly and remove them from the cage and, and usually by the time you remove them from the cage they're easier to handle Canine restraint. With well-behaved dogs, uh, you don't want to use much restraint at all. You want to use the least restraint possible. If we have uncooperative dogs, you need to know how to put a muzzle on, use a towel effectively, or use chemical restraint. And often we can work with dogs for a little bit of time before we resort to chemical re restraint. This is an example of a person showing a standing restraint. This elbow is directly underneath the um, the neck so that there is a gap so the animal can breathe. We have the hand behind the head and this person can use that hand to control uh, that head. Um, the elbow can come up and close, close the, the mouth, mouth if, if necessary, necessary without, without the, the animal, animal being able, able to bite, bite the person. person. The hand the is underneath uh, the animal's um, abdomen to keep, keep the animal in a standing position. position. Cats, uh, well-behaved cats, again, least restraint necessary. Allow them to position themselves to where they're comfortable. Often if we hide their head 
they don't realize anything's going on. They'll know something's going on, but if they can't see you, they're much more comfortable. Um, you want to keep one hand near the back of their neck. Um, uncooperative cats, you may need to use a towel to wrap them up in. Um, scruff, scruffing is something that is commonly done. It's grabbing the, the skin close to the um, muscle underneath the, uh, on the neck. There's a lot of extra skin there and holding it tightly. I don't like scruffing. I will say that I prefer you to grab behind their head and control their head with your fingers versus scruffing. Scruffing can turn into an issue because a lot of cats associate scruffing with bad procedures happening. If we're just holding their head still and holding it in a way that we can control where their head goes, we are much less likely to cause a cat to go into a fight or flight mode. We might be able to use a muzzle, a muzzle clo- uh, covers their eyes as well as um, keeps their mouth uh, covered. Uh, we may have to use gloves. Uh, realize that they can bite through the muzzle and the gloves and the towel, so you have to be very careful still. This is a cat bag. A cat bag keeps all of their limbs in one spot. Um, you put them in, you unzip the bag, put lay it flat, put them in the bag. There's a Velcro closure around the neck that you can close uh, fairly tightly and then zip them into the bag. Um, It can be difficult to get cats into a bag when they don't bend their limbs, uh, but if we can get them into the bag, that at least keeps them in one place. Uh, We typically will move to chemical restraint first, honestly, with cats. If we're able to do it, it is our first choice because once cats get stressed, they tend to stay stressed. And any stressed animal that you put under chemical restraint or medication, sedation of some type, uh, any sedation uh, with a stressed animal can cause a physiologic response that can lead to death. So if we can chemically restrain before an animal gets stressed, that's what we're going to try to do. And with cats, that's sometimes the first thing that we should um, reach for. Important. And we'll say this kind of in a joking manner, but sort of um, actually really serious is that it's if so if you can't get a vein, it's the holder's fault. Um, it's really important for you to be able to restrain the animal uh, calmly and effectively um, and hold the vein in a way that the uh, person who is trying to get blood or place a catheter can see the vein. Um, Positioning for dogs and cats is similar. So this is a sitting cephalic restraint, meaning we're going for the cephalic vein, which is on the front limb of dogs and cats and and all animals. Um, This person is holding the head close to them. They've got their head head close to the animal. So if the animal suddenly rears back, they're not going to bang against their head. They'll just move it aside a little bit. Um, They've got their underneath their arm. Is they have reached over and they have reached over the animal's uh, arm and pu- and then then put their thumb down and then brought it across and you will notice that their thumb is perpendicular to the length of the arm so it's holding across the entire arm so that they're holding the the vessel. The reason for this is the vessel normally travels toward the inside of the leg. If like it makes it easier to see and access. So that's why they're doing it this way. The other thing that they're doing is making sure that they're getting the elbow straightened. If the elbow is straightened, that means they can't pull it back. So elbow straight, have them tucked in close to you, um, hold that vessel Uh, perpendicular so that you've got the entire arm occluded so that the person can get blood uh, from that vessel. Restraint from nail trimming can be anywhere from holding on to the animal, making sure they stand up and holding one leg so they can't uh, get their balance. Um, If they're unruly or difficult to handle, putting them in a lateral position either on a table or on a pad on the floor putting your elbow across their neck so they can't raise their neck and holding their bottom limbs that are close to the floor um, up a little bit so they can't get their legs underneath them. So those things are important for keeping an animal uh, down on their side. 
we can use a towel or stretch a cat out, um, but you would, in order to hold the cat out and stretch it, you're going to hold on to their neck um, in the way that I described, right behind their head, in kind of a vice grip behind their head so they can't move their head, or um, uh, their scruff and their back legs. Those are ways that we can hold them. For horses, there are risks for human injury uh, and risks for animal injury, so we don't want to chase them. We want to watch their blind spots. This is somebody moving around the back of a horse uh, with his hand on the rump of the horse, and that tells the horse that he's there from this side of the horse to the other side of the horse. When horses, horses have eyes on either side of their head, so they have vision that is not connected in their brain. Whatever happens on one side of the, the horse, the left eye, is something brand new that's happening on the right eye. So we have to do what we can to connect those two halves of the brain and keeping your hand on the back of the horse as you move from their left side to the right side is one of those ways we can connect that. Um, we want to watch for any warnings of impending kicks when they're raising their legs. Sometimes that means they're going to uh, prepare to kick. Um, or if they shift, just shift their weight to the other side, that can be a sign. You want to just stay cl as close as you can with a hand in the horse at all times. A lot of people like to move away from the horse, but more damage can be done if they have room to kick versus if you're standing close to them, all they can do is just push you away a little bit. With equine capture, um, first of all, you have to know how to put a halter on. Um, with a halter, there's a small end and a big end, and the small end goes through the nose, and then you, you put the larger end around the ears and fasten it underneath their neck. Uh, when we approach a horse, we typically go to the left side. That's what most horses are used to because they're trained to be approached and mounted from the left side. This goes back historically to when people wore um, uh, swords on their left side because they would draw it primarily with their right hand. Uh, and if you wear a sword on your left side, you could not mount from the right. You would have to mount from the left hand side. So people approach from the left hand side, um, I'll put the halter on with the left side, lead on the left side. Uh, and that's a typical way that horses will be approached. Now, if you have an animal that has been uh, trained in what, what we call a natural manner or trained in, it, in the American Indian way, they can be approached from either side. Um, so we're going to use a lead rope and sometimes with a lead rope if it has a chain attached, if we have an unruly horse or a stallion, we will attach the chain over the nose because it will keep them from moving forward against that pressure. Um, diversionary, uh, one way, when we're leading a horse, we always recommend you keep a loose lead rope, just like with a, uh, an animal. But if you have a horse that is trying to bite or um, trying to come at you in some way, keeping your elbow in between you and the horse is really important. Um, Tying a horse, learning how to tie a horse properly is really important. This horse is tied closely to a fence um, so that it uh, can't move its head too much. Moving its head allows it to see around itself and allows it to uh, gain momentum for a kick. So we want to keep it close to the fence, but we want to tie it in such a way that we can release that tie very quickly. If horses get upset, they can hurt themselves pretty quickly, and sometimes we just need to let them go. So this this is a release knot, um, that it's a um, half hitch release knot that allows us to uh, release the animal if we need to. Uh, this is called diversionary restraint. One way is to twitch a horse, and this is somebody using their hand to pinch the upper lip of the horse and kind of twist it a little bit. That encourages, not super painful, but it is a little uncomfortable. It encourages them to focus on the nerves that are being um, energized or stimulated there in the lip versus anything that might be happening with the rest of their body. We can use a twitch that is a metal twitch uh, that pinches or we can use a rope that we wrap around there and just twist it. Um, and uh, I don't use that very often. I find there are other ways to divert the animals or to, to um, familiarize themselves them with the handling. This is another type of diversionary. It's just 
um, pinching some skin along the neck um, and it's just uh, it's as if if you're getting a shot sometimes somebody will pinch you before giving you the needle it's just a way to make the nerves busy in another area it actually causes um, the nerves that are actually hurt to not recognize that they're being hurt so we have a little uncomfortable spot and a hurt spot and they're actually going to pay attention to the uncomfortable spot um, a couple of other things here. This is um, handling a foal. I have this here because foals are actually sometimes more dangerous than their larger um, adult counterparts uh, because they are completely instinctual and impetuous and they just strike out and bite um, pretty um, easily. So handling them frequently can reduce this. Uh, this is a foal that is looks like it's ready to jump right out of this um, handler's hands. Uh, its uh, muscles are all tensed up. Um, she is holding it um, on enough. You'll see that there's a barrier, a soft barrier here between mom and foal, so mom can still see. Um, so that helps to keep the foal a little bit calmer. Um, this is a picture of somebody who has desensitized their horse to handling, and this can be really helpful. Um, this person has gotten to the point where they're able to stand on this horse. It's just going to—it's—it's it's got its ears back and it's alert, but it's just aware of what its owner is doing. The owner's standing on the horse, and it's—he's uh, waving his whip around. This horse is standing there because he knows that. There's no reason to be scared. So this is the this is the point at which you have a prey animal that is completely desensitized to a lot of different handling, and that's what we're really trying to go for. We use stocks when we're using doing procedures with large animals just to keep everybody stay, safe. You do want to be careful. Um, I have this um, pointed out. You can wave things in and back behind to encourage movement, but if you start hitting um, or using this broom in a way that causes fear in this horse, why would you want to do that? Be, th be thoughtful of what you're using. Because if you're causing fear with a broom, we use brooms in the stall all the time. Uh, in, the, in the stables all the time. So we don't want to create fear with common objects. Um, we want to just use it in a way that encourages movement, uh, but not in a way that is going to be um, cause fear in this animal. So moving this animal into the stocks, closing these stocks up, keeps this animal from moving from side to side, keeps it from moving uh, front to back, um, and keeps it safe. So these areas are padded, so it's not going to create an issue with this animal. Um, Here's another animal in a stocks uh, that are that is outside. So it's been moved in. Um, it's probably tied into place, but obviously somebody stepped away uh, safely to take a picture. Um, we're going to um, give you videos on how to do proper restraints, and we're going to ask you to show us some videos of your proper restraints, and or we're going to try to um, do some in person if we can. Cattle. Uh, and swine and other ruminants. Um, so we do have risks when working with cattle. They're big animals. Uh, we have to watch about, uh, be careful of human injury, animal injury. We always want to uh, observe the herd from a distance first and use low stress handling. When we're moving cattle, we use something called a pressure and release system. So we're going to walk, we don't want to create panic. So we're going to walk towards them and then stop and then walk towards them and stop. We want them to walk slowly to the area where we want them to go. We don't want them to panic and start a stampede. We need to find that point of balance uh, when we're doing this pressure and release system so that we move uh, just fast enough um, at, a, at the right angle in order to get them to move in the right direction. When you think about um, herding dogs, uh, when you watch them work cattle or work sheep, you'll see them move and then lay down, and then move and then lay down. And that's what we're looking for when we're moving any livestock. Um, when we have them uh, uh, captured, uh, we're going to try to get them into some sort of corral or enclosure. Um, we may be able to, in some cases with dairy cattle, they're, they're habituated to uh, using a halter. So we may get them into a halter. We use that halter to tie them to uh, places or to the, lead them. The halter fits a little differently than you would for a horse. Um, the halter uh, will fit in such a way that when you're leading them, the pressure you're putting on them is under the jaw instead of really over the nose. Um, and 
that is how we lead cattle. Um, so we use a halter. We often use a head gate or a head catch. Uh, and dairy cow uh, cows are habituated to this. They're fed through this. These head catches are not always closed, but often they are while they're feeding. So they get used to feeding and having their head caught in there, and it's not a big deal. This is how they're often milked. Uh, so it's very, uh, um, they're habituated to it. They do it twice a day. Um, it's very easy. So if we need to do a medical procedure, we'll just feed them, put them in the head catch, and then um, either use a halter to keep them closer in place so that we can get a, um, a, ve a vessel um, or use this tail jack procedure where the this person is actually lifting up stiffly on their tail and making them move forward so they won't move back against this. Um, we can use a squeeze chute if we have to do other procedures. Um, this uh, headlock, uh, the tail restraint, tail jack. We can also use foot control and restraint when we, um, we can tie their feet uh, to each other, either hobble them or tie, tie it to something so they can't kick out. There's something called casting cows. Uh, it is not tipping cows, but it's casting cows. And I have a video for that. It's a really unique way that we do to put the cow on its sternum and then on its back or on its uh, side so we can do any procedure that we need to. Um, it's a way of tying a rope a across their back and, and crossing it and then pulling backwards um, with some strength, pulling backwards on them and it causes them to kneel down and then we can actually flip them over. Uh, and it's casting cows is one way we can get them on their side so that we can get, do some procedures with them. Um, swine. Uh, swine can be very aggressive and so we have to be very careful with them. Uh, they, can, they injure each other and they can injure our, us. So we want to observe them first before we approach them. Whenever we approach them, they do have some herding instincts but they will split off from the pack um, as well. Um, so whenever we work with them, we're usually moving them in fairly small groups. We want to use a pig board. This is a, a large, usually um, wooden or plexiglass, a, a plexiglass, a plastic board that with handles on it that you can put in between you and their sharp little teeth. Um, so you're going to keep, because they will rush you and bite you if, and they will go through a rubber boot if they get you. So you want to keep that between you at all times and just move them forward, just encourage encourage them to move in the direction you want. We can isolate one or more of these by putting them in a corner and putting the pig board between them and escape. Some other ways um, we can uh, use uh, is using crowding techniques. So we can crowd them all into a corner and then isolate one um, using that pig board, uh, using a two-person snare technique. So if we have pole, we can snare the upper muzzle of that uh, animal and uh, it holds them at a distance but also um, holds them in place and then uh, they uh, we have their upper muzzle it's a little sensitive so they'll stay in place while somebody else can go in there and uh, do some venipuncture or whatever procedure they need to do. Um, it, if we are working with pigs, anytime you're in a pig barn, you do want to protect yourself, protect your ears. Their squeals are very loud, so over 130 decibels, so earplugs are essential when working with pigs. Um, football hold, we use for smaller pigs or piglets, so just uh, small ruminants, birds, mammal, small animals, mammals, and bird, um, reptiles. Um, sheep, goats, and camelids, llamas, and alpacas, they're easier to handle and don't cause as much problem, but they can um, cause injury um, for themselves or for in the herd very tightly and then move as a group. So we want to work in smaller groups if we can. Using um, dogs uh, to help us can be really helpful with this. Sheep. Uh, sheep are pretty easy to restrain. Uh, typically what we'll do is grab them by the head um, and force them back backwards into a sitting posture. Once they're back in a sitting posture, they don't like to move very much until we let them go. So they're really easy to work with. Um, we can force their head back and then grasp their forelimbs and, and get them back, way back on their rump. We never want to grab the wool with sheep or goats that we use wool for because that can damage this, the wool and the skin. 
with goats, we want to corner the animal with a hand on its jaw, straddle them uh, with their rump to the wall, so they back them into the wall, and then squeeze them with their knees. You can use their horns, if we have mature goats with horns, if you need to um, grab them. We don't want to grab their hair or wool because it can damage the tissue underneath. Restraint techniques for camelids. Um, we may need additional restraint. Uh, we can apply uh, we can hold their grass. They have little halters on them. Birds, avian capture and restraint. So citizens, citizens are parrots, macaws, and parakeets, and these are most often um, kept as pets. Uh, we have to be careful with birds because we have predator birds and prey birds, and we want to house them separately so we don't cre create stress. Um, we want to keep windows and doors closed and shaded when we're going to capture a bird because we don't want them to fly into windows. We want to observe them from a distance before we try to capture them. Uh, when we do capture them, we want to restrain the wings and the legs, but not the keel. So we don't want to press on their chest at all. The keel is that sternum right in the center of their chest. We don't want to press on that at all. If we do, we'll keep them from breathing and suffocate them. Dark rooms are really helpful with birds. If you think about it, there are very few few birds that are up at night and so birds uh, sleep at night so if we shut the lights off and make the room dark they think it's night they actually automatically their physiology starts to shut down so they their blood pressure goes down their blood their heart rate goes down and they're easier to capture Restraining birds, there's one-handed technique, there's a two-handed technique and there's towel technique uh, and we can also use a restraint bo uh, board um, when we are capturing a bird, uh, especially a pet bird, we don't want them to associate our hands with capture and stress. So often what we'll do is use a towel to cover our hands to capture the bird. So we're going to try to uh, capture them with a towel first, our hand behind it. Um, and then we can remove the towel with a smaller bird, but we use, continue to use the towel with a larger bird. We want to um, gather uh, the towel or our fingers behind their heads, behind their mandibles, so that they can't move their beak around and uh, puncture our, our fingers or, or bite our fingers. Um, we want to make sure that we're holding the, um, the wings close to their body, but we don't want to restrain their keel or press on their chest at all. Securing their feet is important because they can use their feet pretty well. With little guys, they will grasp onto your finger and won't use their feet really well. So we can use one hand there. I absolutely want to watch their respiratory rate and effort very carefully and monitor their body temperature. Finches and canaries, we want to restrain as usual for small citizens um, using a single hand method. For birds of prey, they have really strong talons, so we want to use a gloved hand. Uh, we can use towels to help, and uh, a lot of these guys, if they're falconry birds, are used um, for uh, hunting. Um, if we just cover their eyes uh, with a leather hood, that actually calms them down. For small mammals, rabbits, um, we can we want to put them in a football hold, hold them close to your body and tucked underneath your arm. Uh, we want to control their head so we can scruff them like a, like kind of like a cat, um, or hold them behind their head on their neck from the behind the, behind their neck like a cat. Um, but at the same time, we have to secure their hind legs because if we secure them by the scruff alone they can actually kick so hard with their back legs that they will break their own backs and I've seen this happen so you do not want to allow that to happen even when you're putting an animal back in a carrier or back in a cage support those hind legs Towel restraint is really helpful for uncooperative patients. We call these bunny burritos, and we just wrap them pretty tightly in a towel and just keep their, their hind legs and their front legs uh, pretty stiff. Never, never, never obstruct their nose, their nares. Uh, they are obligate nasal breathers, and if they can't breathe through their nose, they cannot breathe. Um, further small mammals, guinea pigs and chinchillas. Guinea pigs 
um, tend to emit high-pitched alarm calls and can defend by biting, so you have to be real careful with that. Don't let those alarm calls deter you, though. You need to, even though they're doing alarm calls, you need to continue to hold them. Um, they can be scruffed and held down to the table. Often with guinea pigs, we just try to lightly hold their, their head and their body, uh, though, because they're used to being handled and typically do pretty well. Chinchillas can struggle and thrash in an attempt to flee and stress will kill them. They are actually horrible pets for little kids because little kids handling them can be can cause them a lot of stress. Often with chinchillas we have to do anesthesia in order to handle them appropriately. Towel restraint can be really helpful so just wrapping them up in a towel. One thing with gerbils specifically is never grab them by the tail. Gerbils, as soon as you grab their tail, will their their skin will detach at a certain point, which is called what we call degloving. Uh, and this is an example of what happens. Even just a light touch on the tail, this is a normal response, um, uh, instinctual response. It will just detach, and then you'll have um, an abnormal tail. Ferrets, um, we want to be really careful with them. Uh, we don't want to use alcohol. Alcohol increases stress with these guys. So if we're needing to sanitize the skin, we want to use um, like a betadine uh, or a chlorhexidine uh, substance um, instead of alcohol. Um, scruffing them is very effective. This is one animal that I definitely recommend scruffing. Them to yawn so we can do an um, they actually relax in the scruff position with their um, uh, whole body just relaxed and then you can support their legs. You can grab hold of their legs, put your finger in between them and grab, grab hold on either side. So usually restrain them in a vertical position for initial examination. Hedgehogs, they say thin leather gloves. I will tell you that those little pokey things go through thin leather gloves. Um, but uh, you... Typically, if we're going to do a, a thorough examination, we do need um, anesthesia because they will not, um, they will not, uh, if they're stressed at all, they will ball up. So if we need to look at their abdomen, uh, if we need to, that sometimes we'll need to do um, uh, uh, anesthesia. For lizards, every species can be handled slightly differently. Um, some amphibians we actually need to, to not handle at all. So like tree frogs, we want to put them in a clear PVC tube, allow them to, to go into the clear PVC uh, because we, we should not handle them at all. Um, we want to read their body language, so they will give us signs flipping their tail back and forth, um, inflating their dewlap, um, mouth gaping. Those are signs that they're going to be aggressive. Um, controlling their head and controlling their tail is typically what we need to do. Um, one unique thing that we can do with lizards, um, and sometimes even with birds, is we can press on their eyeballs uh, out there when they close their eyes and um, that will actually induce a vasovagal response, which lowers their blood pressure and their heart rate and causes them to calm down. So pressing on their eyeballs can be really helpful in restraint. Flip their tail so hard that it causes injury, um, they, can, uh, they can cause some damage. Um, we also can cause damage to them, so we want to be real careful. Sometimes we need to use leather gloves. A uh, towel is a very effective restraint with some of these guys. Be very, very careful. A lot of these guys, when we see them, we're seeing them for metabolic bone disease. Metabolic bone disease is a condition that they're not getting enough calcium or vitamin D um, sunlight in their in their environment, and so, so um, that causes bone fractures. So most, a lot of the times that we're seeing these guys, they're going to be prone to bone fractures. So we have to be very gentle when we're handling them. Sometimes having just a hood to go over their eyes can be calming. And then, like I said, pressure on the eyeballs is calming. With snakes, um, you should never, ever handle venomous snakes without training. If somebody calls and says, I have a rattler, I need to be seen, if you don't have anybody in, our, in your clinic that um, is capable of handling these guys, they've never been trained to it, um, then I would say don't see that pet. Um, 
we often with venomous snakes we're going to use a snake hook a plexiglass shield and a plexiglass tube in order to be able to to um, handle these pets with non-venomous snakes if we can they will bite but if we can control the head just behind the mandible we can control um, their their opening their jaws and, and being able to bite. Um, we can just put their our index finger right on top of their head and push their head down and then get our finger underneath their their uh, mac or their mandible and, and press it up against their maxilla. Uh, we can go around uh, their neck. There's very there are a few snakes that we have to use two hands, but most uh, snakes we can use one hand to do that and then support the snake's body with your opposite hand. Snakes do have personalities. Snakes do get to know their no owners and often having an owner. Um, hand you the snake or help you handle the snake uh, can be very helpful. We use these plexiglass tubes, a clear plexiglass tube. It's a hardware you can get, uh, uh, an item you can get your, at your hardware store. Allow the snake to travel into the tube. They can go forward but not backward um, and then you can hold on to their tail and keep them from exiting the tube beyond what you need to do. A lot of the things that we do with snakes we actually do from their tail area so as long as we have a hold of their tail we can get blood we can do a, a, a uh, an exam on their uh, genitals uh, that kind of thing turtles and tortoises um, are fairly easy to restrain um, the problem becomes when we have to do an oral exam or give an injection because we want to give injections in the um, front third of the of a reptile's body so um, we can grasp the shell we can use a one-handed sandwich grip um, what we need to do is uh, ex if we need to examine their eyes their their nose their their head in any way we need to actually pull those front limbs out and extend them out and hold them out and that will force their head out and then we need to get our our fingers behind their mandibles to keep it from going back in the shell. Um, we can uh, cover the head and the front limbs with cloth if we need to do anything toward the back of the rear of the animal. For x-rays we can put them up on some type of structure a plastic cup uh, to keep their limbs from touching the round that way they can't get out um, uh, move away from that area. That's what we have for animal restraint. Again, this is really, really important. You need to be able to visualize yourself restraining all types of animals, all types of animals, uh, because you will be required at some point to restrain all types of animals. So you really want to visualize yourself going through the motions. We have descriptions everywhere on how to restrain pets. Visualize yourself going through the motions, and then we'll practice, practice, practice. Please come to me with any questions. Thanks.